Welcome to Radio Free Sunroot. You're listening to the interview podcast, Voices for Nature and Peace, where we discuss issues of ecology, empire, justice, and consciousness. We feature a variety of guests who are aware of the challenges of our time and who are working to address them. Here's your host, Calibri Ter Sonnenblum. In Defense of the Last Wild Buffalo, featuring Stephanie C. of the Buffalo Field Campaign. The last wild herd of buffalo in North America spend most of the year in Yellowstone National Park. They are descended from a mere 23 individuals who survived the massive buffalo slaughters of the late 19th century by hiding out in a valley there. Today, the herd numbers in the low thousands, but is still not allowed to live a life free of harassment from humans. The Buffalo Field Campaign was formally founded in 1997, and they employ a variety of tactics to defend and advocate for these buffalo. On December 16th, 2020, I spoke with the campaign's media coordinator, Stephanie C. She's been an earth activist since the late 80s, has apprenticed as a wildlife rehabilitator, and is a student of horses. In 2003, she looked into the eyes of a wild buffalo and has never been the same since. Since 2004, she has been on the front lines with the Buffalo Field Campaign. In our conversation, we talked about the history of the Yellowstone herd and what makes it unique the annual killing of buffalo every year when they migrate out of the park to forage, the brucellosis myth, how the ranching industry opposes buffalo, the effort to have buffalo listed under the Endangered Species Act, how the Park Service rounds up buffalo every year and sends them to slaughterhouses, the genetic concerns with a herd that is kept so small, the importance of buffalo as a keystone species and prairie ecosystems, how domesticated cows do not fill the same ecological role as buffalo, the relationship between buffalo and Native Americans, how activists have mostly halted the hazing of buffalo, and the work of buffalo defense, which has included direct action. This interview was brief, so I'm filling out the episode by adding a reading from my 2019 book, Road Tripping at the End of the World. The excerpt is from a section about Nine Mile Prairie in Nebraska. In it, I discuss the tall grass prairie ecosystem and the buffalo's place in it. Road Tripping at the End of the World is available at my website as an autographed paperback or a digital download. And now, here is my conversation with Stephanie C. Can you tell us what is unique about the Yellowstone buffalo herd? What is unique about the Yellowstone buffalo? Well, they are the last continuously wild population of buffalo that have lived on the landscape since prehistoric times. There's there's about half a million buffalo slash beefalo in the country. All of them have been put there by humans, and the majority of them contain cattle genes or are fenced in um, or, or managed as livestock, game farmed. Um, and so the Yellowstone buffalo is the last continuously wild population. They have no cattle genes. They are pure bison bison, and um, they're pretty special. <laughs> right, and they are also the very last remnant. Can you tell us uh, the story briefly of how that happened, that they are the last bit that's left? Yeah, so back in the uh, late... 19th century when the war was being waged against native people and the buffalo um there were 23 individual buffalo who saved themselves by seeking refuge in Yellowstone's Pelican Valley and those uh buffalo the buffalo we know today are the descendants of of that individual group so 23 were left yes that's left in the wild. That's yep. insane because, of course, it was what something. I mean, I know there's different um, estimates, but twenty to forty million to start with. Upwards of seventy million. Upwards of seventy million. 
And so these last 23 that somehow slipped through the nets uh, just made their way to Yellowstone. And then did they receive any kind of protection there at first? Or They did. Ironically, the very government who was initiating their slaughter uh, sent in the U.S. Cavalry to protect them from, from poachers. And um, eventually Yellowstone National Park became established in response to that as well. So it, it is funny because, you know, the government who was kind of, you know, saying, hey, let's go kill all these buffalo. Let's try to destroy the native people. We'll kill all the buffalo who they depend on. Suddenly there's all, they're almost all gone, and the, they're, the 23 that were found, the government sent in the army to come and protect them after they had been the ones who had practically driven them to extinction. Okay. And then over the course of time, that herd uh, grew in numbers into the hundreds and then even into the thousands? It did. So the buffalo, the 23, are what's now known as the central herd. And there are, is another herd in Yellowstone, the northern herd. And those buffalo, some of them were brought in from other places, from individuals um, who saw what was going on, had seen a small group of buffalo and decided they were going to protect them. And they did that. And then they later brought them to Yellowstone when Yellowstone was established. And that became the northern herd. So your central herd um, is the the last continuously wild population. And they, like I said, have lived on this landscape since prehistoric times. And unfortunately, they are, they're not doing okay. They're imperiled and we're trying to gave them protection under the Endangered Species Act. Right, right. It's it's hard to believe that they're already not in a, a protected species under the Endangered Species Act. Is that uh, because of politics around, say, ranching or? Oh, yeah. Yep, that's exactly right. Right, because what happens every year, and, and really one of the main focuses of your work, is that a number of these buffalo are slaughtered every season. Right. So bison and buffalo are a migratory species. They move with the changing seasons, the availability of food. And Yellowstone National Park is located on a really high plateau. And during the winters, the snow gets incredibly deep. And while bison are an ice age mammal, they're built for winter. Um, it's still, when the snows get that deep, they have to move and seek lower elevation habitat. And when they do that, that ends up bringing them into Montana west into the Hebgen Basin, which is outside of West Yellowstone, Montana, and also north into the Gardner Basin, which is near Gardner, Montana. And when they come into Montana, the livestock interests just have an incredible hissy fit. They don't want to share the grass with these native bovines. They have um, tried to use a scare tactic of a disease called brucellosis, saying that oh, the buffalo, they're going to threaten our livestock and our livelihoods with giving our cattle brucellosis. And brucellosis is a, is, a, is a disease that ungulates get that, and other animals too, um, that came from European cattle. So the cattle industry brought this disease here, and there's never been an incident of wild bison transmitting brucellosis to cattle, even where they coexist. But on the other hand, elk, who have also been um, given this disease, have been implicated numerous times in Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming for transmitting it back to cattle, yet they are free to roam. There's, they, they don't have this war waged against them in the way that the buffalo do, at not even close. And so when you really, really would look at this, the issue is really all about the grass and who gets to eat it. And Montana's livestock industry is hell-bent on making sure that their cattle are the ones who get to eat the grass and the buffalo are not allowed to restore themselves. So we have a lot of work cut out for us because in Montana, the livestock industry has tremendous political clout in the state government as well as in the federal government. And so right now, they're they're pretty much calling all the shots and the the centuries-old range war that was waged against the buffalo continues to this day. Right. I'd, I'd like to return just uh, briefly to the brucellosis myth and talk about the details of that slightly because, the, uh, because it, as you said, there's no documented case of it being passed from buffalo to, to domesticated cows. And I guess that 
the circumstances to do so are really specific and have to do with uh, a domesticated cow would have to come into contact with an, uh, um, a miscarried fetus of a buffalo or something? I mean... Correct. Yes, that's absolutely right. And that is never going to happen. That's just never going to happen. Um, and so if a buffalo... I, and we hate to really talk about this disease so much because it really is not the issue. And it kind of feeds the fire for the Department of Livestock and the livestock interests that, that try to use this excuse. But in in scientifically in reality um if a a buffalo and it would be a female buffalo were to be infected with brucellosis she would miscarry and that would happen in the in the middle of winter around february and if that happens you're going to have all kinds of predators scavengers and others that are going to just come and wipe that off the face of the earth there will not be any trace left and also thinking there's no cows present near Buffalo during the, the winter time because the cows can't even handle this climate. They can't. They wouldn't survive. So they go. They get taken to lower elevation <laughs> habitat by humans every year. Um, and should sh- should it happen later in the summer, which it it doesn't, um, it would die in direct sunlight. And one of the most miraculous things, which we have witnessed in person. When a buffalo gives birth, she eats the placenta. She eats everything. There's nothing left to, to for a cow to be worried about. She eats everything. And any anything that might be left on the grass, um, any fluids or anything like that, birds and other animals come in and take care of all of that. So there's really a non-issue when it comes to bison and cows and the threat of brucellosis transmission. And in fact, the only times that there has been um, instances of transmission between bison and cattle has been human-induced. In fact, it was introduced into the Yellowstone population when uh, the park had domestic livestock that they would eat and get milk from, and they had found an orphaned bison calf, and they thought, hey, why don't we bring it to these domestic cattle, and they can take care of it. And so this little baby buffalo started nursing on a cow who had brucellosis, and that's how the disease got into the population. And the only other times that has been transmitted is through laboratory situations where it was forcibly fed. Right. Okay. So, so basically there's just absolutely nothing to this at all. That's, that's, that's no. okay. So when the, when the, when the, when the Buffalo, uh, during the winter time, when they go down to the lower land to forage for food, are they going on to uh, private land or public land or both? Both. Both. Okay. So most of Yellowstone National Park, uh, especially on the uh, west and northern boundaries, is surrounded by uh, Gallatin National Forest land, which is public land. Um, there are sections of private lands scattered within all of that. Most of those private lands are largely buffalo-friendly, yet the state of Montana still gets to call all the shots. It's really strange. In the western states, you have uh, the federal land managers, uh, like the Forest Service, for example. They manage the land, but even on those lands, it's the state agencies that manage the wildlife as if they're separate things, which we know that they're not. But that's how it works in in Montana and other western states. So when buffalo come on to Gallatin National Forest, suddenly they become the management jurisdiction of the state of Montana. And in this case, because of a law that was um, established in the mid-90s, it's called MCA 81-2-120, the Montana Department of Livestock has authority over wild bison when they migrate into Montana. And that's just like putting the fox in charge of the hen house. Wow, I didn't know about that detail. That's just completely ridiculous. It's insane. And we're we're trying to get that law repealed, but with our legislator being legislature being heavily <laughs> run by livestock interests, we it's pretty hard to get that done. Right, right, because the, the history of the western states is that there was uh ranching there 
before any of these places were even territories. And so when the territorial governments formed and then when the state governments formed, the ranchers were right there doing that. They were there writing the original laws. They were filling the original offices. And they've really been in power uh, since day one. Exactly. And they were killing people who got in their way. I mean, literally murdering people who got in their way. And there's a book that uh, if folks who are interested in this should read, it's called In the Presence of Buffalo. It's written by Dan Brister, who used to be our executive director. He since has gone on to law school, um, but it, he details the, that aspect of the livestock industry and, and the incredible and brutal power that they wield in this state and other Western states as well. Yeah, and so can we talk about uh, the Endangered Species Act for a moment? And, I mean, you must be, how, how, how has that gone? Well, we filed the petition. Uh, we, Buffalo Field Campaign, as, uh, along with Western Watersheds Project, um, and Friends of Animals is also helping us in a litigation aspect. We filed that petition in 2014. So that's already been over six years now. Um, and we're in the courts. It's, it takes a really long time. We've had a couple of positive federal rulings um, because the Fish and Wildlife Service Issued, initially issued a negative finding, and we challenged that finding, saying that they did not use the best available science, and federal court upheld our decision um, and made them go back to the drawing board. And then there was a, yet another challenge, and they had to go back to the drawing board again. And so the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has been kind of hemming and hawing, trying their best not to have to take care of these buffalo under the Endangered Species Act, but um, our, our petition still stands, and it, again, we're, we're, <laughs> there's going to be another court decision coming up soon, and I'm sorry I'm not that articulate on, on the, the legality components of the ESA, but um, we're, looking at, we're looking at probably another maybe five years before there's a final decision made. Wow, okay. And, and in the meantime, you know, Yellowstone continues to capture and kill hundreds of buffalo every year. Yeah, tell us a little bit more about the how the the Park Service uh, in Yellowstone is involved with this whole thing. You would think, and and this is, I think, part of why this goes on because nobody in their right mind would ever consider the notion that Yellowstone National Park would be capturing and killing our national mammal, but they do. They every year there's a, there's a, on the north side in the Gardner Basin inside Yellowstone's boundaries, um, there's the Stevens Creek. Uh, bison trap. It's an enormous livestock, like livestock paradigm, industrial strength capture facility um, where they lure or haze buffalo who are migrating to lower elevations into this trap, into these really giant fenced in areas, and then they funnel them down into smaller and smaller fenced in areas until they get them into um, sorting pens and they have to go through the squeeze chute and then the f families are separated and all, all these buffalo are shipped off to slaughterhouses from within Yellowstone's boundaries. And they intend this year to capture and kill up to upwards of 900 buffalo this year. Wait, so the National Park Service itself is capturing... Uh, members of this last herd of wild buffalo and slaughtering them themselves. They aren't slaughtering them. They are capturing them and they are handing them off to people who take them to slaughter facilities. Wow. So they're just trucked, uh, trucked away from the yep. park. Exactly. I, I don't understand at all how this would work into uh, having, I don't understand how this would work from a conservation viewpoint at all. No, and it violates the Organic Act, which the National Park Service is, is works under, um, and it definitely violates their their mandate of um, oh, what is it, leaving park park service resources unimpaired for future generations. I mean, there's violations all over the place with this, and um, yet they're doing it. They're bending over backwards to appease Montana's livestock industry. Right, because they have some sort of number, right, that they want to keep the herd under? Well, so, okay, so the buffalo are managed today under 
an expired plan called the Interagency Bison Management Plan. And that was largely crafted by livestock interests. Um, it's a state and federal um, plan, and within that plan, they try to place a population cap of about 3,500 buffalo on there, and that's what they—that's the population that they continue to try to achieve. That population cap has zilch to do with science or ecology or biology. It is completely political. The buffalo of Yellowstone have never even come close to reaching carrying capacity within the park's boundaries, much less the carrying capacity of the park and the land surrounding the park within the entire greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Um, so the 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 carrying capacity that is set by the plan is politically based and has absolutely nothing to do uh, with science. So the park itself, and you can ask park biologists about this, um, could sustain well over upwards of 7,000 buffalo just within the boundaries alone. And they'll also tell you that the buffalo, they aren't even using all of the available suitable habitat. They create and manage their own suitable habitat. There's even more habitat within the park that they haven't even chosen to use yet. So, cause, so I mean, there's so much more ground, and there's so the park could sustain so many more buffalo. And then if you include all the land surrounding the park, that could sustain even thousands more. And so to have these agencies come up with these numbers of killing these buffalo year after year after year after year, there's no science for it. There's no sound reason that this should be happening. This is all based on politics and the political sway of the livestock industry. And so all of this must be affecting the health of the herd in general. I imagine that there's probably genetic concerns about keeping there, it. There are genetic concerns, and the park biologists will tell you that much as well. Um, and we see it, it, it. We see it physically in the adult females. Because the the when there's a problem genetically, it manifests in adult females through the mit mitochondrial DNA. So what you'll end up seeing are females with weird shaped horns, horns that are going in different directions, horns that are pointing forward, horns that are pointing sideways, like, and that is an indicator of genetic um, distress. That's very sad. It's awful. I mean, and they, these guys, these buffalo, you know, they they don't need our help. We could have healthy, large populations of wild migratory buffalo if humans just got out of the way. That's all we need to do. They don't need us to intervene. They don't need us to do anything. Maybe we could take down some fences, put up some safe passages along highways. But them alone, they just need us to get out of the way, and they could restore themselves, and it wouldn't really take that long. Is there kind of a vision that you or other activists have for what you would really like to see? Like they're like, wow, here's what we would really, we'd like to see these lands opened up or et cetera. Is there, is there kind of a picture like that? I mean, there is a picture like that. I mean, um, I guess I don't exactly know what you mean. I mean, we, our vision is for Buffalo to, to do as they choose, to roam freely, to, to be on the lands that are their birthright, to reestablish themselves in the places where they once existed. And that's throughout most of North America. And this wouldn't just be uh, benefiting the Buffalo. This would be benefiting the ecosystems as a whole, because there's other uh, 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 species, including plants and other animals, who would have been interacting with the buffalo. Absolutely, this would benefit. This would benefit native humans. This would benefit grizzly bears. This would benefit prairie dogs. This would benefit the climate because bison are carbon sequesterers. So when they get back on the landscape, they can help cool this rapidly warming planet. I mean, this would benefit countless species that once all benefited from the presence of buffaloes, whether it was from, you know, the buffaloes carrying seeds on their coats or fertilizing the soil or creating wallows that would be, you know, temporary aquatic habitat, you know, or keeping the grasses to a level where prairie dogs felt safe and could flourish or, you know, being able to live and die on the landscape where grizzly bears and wolves could eat them and flourish. 
I mean, the buffalo are a keystone species, and when they are doing well and when they are healthy, everyone that lives in their community is doing well and is healthy. Right, and the cows, uh, domestic cows, do not inhabit the same niche at all. I know that some proponents of ranching say, oh, it's okay to have cows in these landscapes because there were buffalo there before, and they're just kind of doing the same thing. Yeah, they're not doing the same thing. The cows aren't from this continent. They are not like high and dry grazers. They're wetland species. And so when you have cows, especially in the western states, they trample the earth. They destroy rivers and creeks. They kill habitat. They destroy all kinds of species' homes. Um, They rip grass. They don't just gently graze and move on. They destroy the things that they touch. I mean, all you have to do is walk through a, a field where cattle have been grazing and you just wonder where is the life that was here it's just gone and in their hooves are shaped much differently they have leave a similar track but a cow's hoof is much more flat and tramps down the land where a buffalo's hoof has a little bit of a curve to it and they help gently till the soil i can't tell you how many times i've been in the field and i've been watching a herd from a distance of buffalo and you know there's all these little teeny tiny beautiful plants that that grow in the springtime and and you're like oh my god all these buffalo there's no way these plants are going to be okay and then you go there and everything is just just fine and you can see where they've grazed just the tops of the grasses all these other little plants that they haven't eaten that they've been moving through are intact are beautiful are healthy and there's almost except for their poops you they hardly leave any trace and it's a, it's just such a beautiful thing how North America's largest land mammal can move through such a fragile ecosystem and and almost leave no trace of their presence. And all of this is obviously also mixed up with the history of and the current politics around Native Americans. Yes, because the federal government decided, well... We know how much that Native people depend on the buffalo, so if we can destroy the buffalo, then we can subjugate the Native people. And it goes on to this day. I mean, you know, a part of the part of the reason it's not just about cows. I mean, this is continuation of genocide. Because when buffalo are allowed to freely roam and restore themselves on their land, Native people, especially Plains tribes, are not going to have to rely on the U.S. government for anything. And the government fears that. They don't want that to happen. And so... That's part of the issue here. Right, right. And plus their ways of interacting with the animals were much different than the ways that are being used by uh, the state of Montana or the Park Service. I mean, the Native Americans didn't use helicopters, right, to haze the buffalo? No. I mean, they lived with them, you know. There was relationship and reciprocity. There There was respect. There was their relatives. So really, the whole thing is just, uh, it's, it's, really, it's really a continuing legacy of, of settler colonialism, one could say. It is, exactly right. It's a centuries-old range war. Because the, the way that the, the, the slaughter happens when they leave, because, because we didn't quite get into the details of this, but when they leave the park, then there's people who are basically who are watching and waiting for them, right? There are, um, yeah. I mean, the state and federal agencies, there's a lot of hunters as well um, who are waiting for them to leave the park. Um, most of the, I don't know if you were referring to the hazing operations, but we, oh, yeah. Over, mm-hmm. yeah, over the course of the years, we've put almost, a, almost an end to hazing operations. Those are very rare to occur these days, um, especially over here in the Hebgen Basin. We gained... Uh, year-round habitat for the buffalo, which includes uh, Horse Butte, which is part of Gallup's National Forest, and it's one of the buffalo's favored calving calving grounds. And um, we had a huge victory um, being able to halt the hazing operations, um, industrial strength, like you were saying, using helicopters, horses, cowboys on horses, every law enforcement agency you could possibly think of, um, just running buffalo for for. 10 to 15 miles in a day, including tiny little newborn calves or pregnant moms in labor. Um, And that has almost been put to an end. And so 
we are very grateful for that, but we still have a long way to go. Because we're we're in the we're in the season now where they're leaving uh, the park again soon. Yeah, typically you know winter time we get migrations into the Hebgen Basin and into the Gardner Basin because get like I said the snows get so deep in the park's interior that the buffalo need to get to some lower elevation habitat. Um, we haven't had a, a large migration yet this year. We don't have a whole lot of snow yet either. But as soon as those big snows come, the buffalo will come. And then in the spring, we also get uh, large migrations, especially over here in the Hebgen Basin, where the central herd comes out to return to their calving grounds to give birth. And so you all have a lot of different ways that you have of trying to stop what's going on, which I believe has included direct action. It has, and it's made a big difference. A lot of the people who come and volunteer here, they they witness what's happening to the buffalo, and they just have to do something about it. And so there's been a lot of individuals who have taken direct action, shutting down traps, um, shutting down roads to access the traps, uh, what have you. And, and those tactics have worked. I mean, there used to be two operational capture facilities over here in the Hebgen Basin, and those are gone. One of them still stands, but it hasn't been used in about 10 years. The other one hasn't been put up since the last time it was occupied. And, again, we've gained year-round habitat over here in the Hebgen Basin. Over in the Gardner Basin, where Yellowstone's trap is, while that has been challenged by individuals as well, it is it is a monstrous industrial strength. Um, it's huge, and there's a giant public lands closure surrounding it. So it's a really difficult place to even see, much less attack. <laughs> um, but so, you know, we we pride ourselves on using pretty much every tool in the toolbox from, you know, legal action to direct action to everything in between. The thrust of what we do um, is we, we run daily field patrols where we uh, monitor the buffalo's migration. We're with them every day, watching them where they are, how many there are, and where, and um, any actions that are made against them. We document those um, with video cameras or still cameras, and we share that footage with the public, with decision makers, with um, policy makers, and the media, and um, share their story and share the perspective that we have from being with them on the ground, which is which is unique. I mean, there's nobody else out here doing what we do. Um, so we, we, we have a really good sense of what's going on with the buffalo, and we've pretty much become, um, well, we have been for years, the, the leading source of news um, for what's happening out here. I believe individuals have also, from time to time, attempted to disrupt the hunting of them as well when they leave the park. That ha- doesn't happen so much these days. Um, that did happen in the beginning, in the early, early years before Buffalo Field Campaign was formed, and we do kind of still get blamed for that. But um, we, you know, we don't oppose hunting. Some of us are hunters. We don't feel that this buffalo hunt is appropriate because there is no year, you know, there's not much habitat for them. They're getting gunned down at the boundaries. Um, they've got this capture and slaughter facing them as well, but we also know that a lot of hunters are big constituents for the animals that they choose to hunt, and so we are trying to work with a lot of the hunters to help strengthen, bolster a voice for, for, for wild buffalo in Montana. Right. Well, yes, in the history of conservation, uh, definitely hunters and, and fishermen have had a role to play. Right. Well, speaking of helping the buffalo, how is it that people can help out your campaign? Well, if COVID wasn't happening, we would say, please come join us on the front lines and volunteer. Uh, We would love to have you out here. But at the moment, we're not accepting volunteers just to keep everybody safe and healthy. But um, obviously, monetary donations are always helpful, in-kind donations, and everything's um, tax-exempt. and we have a weekly email update from the field where you can subscribe to that and you can hear about what's going on with the buffalo and learn about all the different ways you can take action. We have a take action page on our website that actually I don't 
know exactly when this is going out, but there's one action on there that has just tomorrow is the last day to submit comments to stop some cattle grazing allotments in the buffalo's habitat. Um, and there we have newsletters and DVDs that you can just get in touch with us and ask for some and put those out in your communities, have like a host of video showings, and you can show people what the kinds of things that, that we see, that we document, that the buffalo are going through. There's tons of different ways that you can help um, just from the comfort of your own home. And as soon as 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 soon as we're feeling pretty good about it, uh, we'll start to open our doors back up to volunteers. And, and there's nothing nothing like just being out here in person and being in the field, going on patrol and being with these buffalo and, and, and getting to know them and then also seeing all the different challenges that they have to face. It's just an honor to be out here to stand with these beings. Anything you want to say to wrap it up? Uh, check out our website, buffalofieldcampaign.org. You can also find us on Facebook, and we're starting to do some live feeds. So once or twice a week, you'll get to, to be in the field with us <laughs> from the comfort of your phone or laptop. And, uh, yeah, just find out, learn more about what's going on, sign up for our newsletter, and then let everyone that you know what's happening out here. Because we have a say in this, spread the word to save the herd. In a state of shock after the war, we interrupt our program for a brief message. If you appreciate this podcast, please consider supporting Colibri on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash Colibri. That's K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. And now, back to our regularly scheduled... The following is an excerpt from my 2019 book, Road Tripping at the End of the World. This is from the section called Nine Mile Prairie. I was born and raised in Nebraska, but only years after moving away was my curiosity piqued about prairies. As an ecosystem type, prairies exist in conditions too moist for desert flora and too dry to support forest. Grasses are the most prevalent family of plants in prairies, both in number of species and in sheer mass. Forbs, which are non-grass plants without woody stems, so not trees or shrubs, are less common but totally essential. Trees are rare, except near water. The prairies of the Great Plains formed two to 5,000 years after the last glaciers retreated. Retreating ice left behind mixed sediments that were gradually built into topsoil over many centuries, with the addition of wind-borne dust and decayed organic matter. The ecosystem co-evolved with various animals, including buffalo, elk, deer, rabbits, and prairie dogs, the last of whom played an important role in aerating the soil and creating channels for water penetration with their extensive tunneling. At one time, prairies dominated Illinois, southern and western Minnesota, Iowa, northern Missouri, southwestern Manitoba, both Dakotas, Nebraska, Kansas, Oklahoma, central Texas, southern Saskatchewan, southeastern Alberta, Montana, and the eastern parts of Wyoming, Colorado, and New Mexico. At their peak, the North American prairies covered 677,394 square miles an area nearly a quarter of the size of the lower 48 states. Within this vast zone, tall grass prairies grew in the east, where it was wetter at a lower elevation, and short grass prairies in the west, where it was drier and higher, with mixed grass prairie taking up the wide land in between. Grasses might strike most people as boring, but the many species found in tall grass prairies are not the stuff of lawns. Growing three to six feet high, they send down roots five to twelve feet. Though their vegetative portion is the most obvious part to us, and is indeed tall, the majority of the plant's bulk is underground. In the case of big bluestem grass, the volume of the roots is two to four times greater than the foliage. The masses of roots often form thick, perennial rhizomes that both spread horizontally and dig down deeply. How big can they get? 
According to Paul A. Johnsgard of the School of Biological Science at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, the famous ecologist John Weaver, quote, once calculated that a square foot of big blue stem sod might contain about 5.5 linear feet and an acre about 400 miles of densely matted rhizomes from the surface to a depth of only a few inches. John Scard goes on to say, quote, The strong roots of big blue stem have individual tensile strength of 55 to 64 pounds, making prairie sod one of the strongest of natural organic substances. It is indeed strong enough to construct sod-built houses that have sometimes lasted a century or more in the face of Nebraska's relatively inhospitable climate. All of this plant material, both above and below ground, ends up producing a lot of decomposed organic matter every season. About 3,000 pounds per acre on the surface and 2,000 per acre underground. The turnover rate from production to decomposition is also fast, taking about 15 months above ground and only three to four years below. This contrasts greatly with ecosystems that feature more trees and shrubs. With such woody plants, turnover rate can be measured in decades. Fire played a crucial role in maintaining vegetation on the prairie by suppressing trees, returning nutrients to the soil, and clearing away vegetative detritus. Animals loved the fresh green shoots that popped up afterwards. Herds of buffalo would travel hundreds of miles to graze such spots. Native Americans called prairie fires the red buffalo, and they set them intentionally as part of their gathering and hunting activities. Given that the prairies are only five to 8,000 years old, and that humans have been living in the Americas for much longer, the role that Native Americans played in the formation of the prairies was quite possibly foundational. Some have described their actions as comprising, quote, land management, but that term is problematic given the contrast between Native American and European relationships to the land the former being more participatory, and the latter more dominating, if not malicious. Wild tending is a better word for what the Native Americans were doing, perhaps. The, quote, opening of the West to colonial settlement had a devastating effect on the prairie ecosystems and their denizens. The invaders who rushed into these lands in the 1800s, especially after the building of the cross-country railroad, plowed under the grasslands and hunted the buffalo nearly to extinction. The slaughter of the buffalo herds by Europeans is an event of such enormous scale that I would characterize it as unimaginable. In 1800, these animals numbered in the range of 30 to 60 million individuals. Accounts from that time describe herds of animals stretching to the horizon. Try to picture that. I can't. My eye knows only the colonized landscape, tilled under, chopped down or raked over, and bereft of such large numbers of any kind of animal. The commercial hide industry is what led to the buffalo's near extinction. Highly organized hunting parties killed hundreds, if not thousands, of animals every day. Hides were pulled off the carcasses by pounding a spike through the dead animal's nose and hooking it up to a team of horses. The remainder of the animal was left to rot. Later, impoverished settlers collected the bones, which were shipped to factories for making fertilizer. Profit was not the only motive, though. It was well known that the Native American tribes of the Great Plains depended on the buffalo for food, and that by wiping out the animals, you would be threatening the indigenous humans. Decisions at the federal level in Washington, D.C. supported this policy. When a government intentionally sets out to destroy a group of people based on ethnicity, that is the literal definition of genocide. By the 1880s, the buffalo had been reduced to a few hundred animals. Some were protected on private ranches by individuals wishing to save them. The last remnant of truly wild buffalo hid out in a valley in Yellowstone National Park and numbered just 23 at its lowest point. From tens of millions to mere hundreds in a few decades. What kind of travesty is that? What kind of sickness has overtaken a people when they engage in that kind of behavior? This greed cannot be excused as human nature, since other humans cohabitated with the creatures for millennia without acting the same way, and in fact expanded their range with their wild-tending practices. No, there is something special about Western civilization, and I mean that in the worst way. The outbreak of brutality can be traced to the agricultural revolution, a dramatic shift that led directly to cultures based on hierarchical domination and to lifestyles dependent on widespread environmental degradation. This new worldview took expression in the biblical injunction in Genesis 1.28, 
to, quote, subdue the earth, and to, quote, have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth, end quote. Other translations replace have dominion over with rule, reign over, be masters of, or in charge of, and these are all synonyms, so the top-down character of this relationship is not in dispute. Contemporary adherents to the Abrahamic religions, who wish to recast their faith as environmentally responsible, must reckon with this concept, which is at the heart of their traditions, and without which the moral of the story is very different. Believe it or not, the Yellowstone buffalo is still threatened. Though it grew throughout the 20th century, and in the past decade its numbers have floated around four to 5,000, its individuals are not protected from being slaughtered. If they go outside the park boundaries, which they tend to do every winter in search of food and calving grounds, they are at the mercy of the Interagency Bison Management Plan, under which the Montana Department of Livestock and National Park Service harass, capture, and kill buffalo. Over 11,500 have been murdered under this program since 1985. The stated pretext is that buffalo will endanger cattle by infecting them with brucellosis, but there has never been a single documented case of this happening. No matter what spurious excuses put forward, the true motivation for the annual killing is much deeper and darker, and it is this. Western civilization is just that profoundly sick that it can't leave this last wild remnant in peace. It must torture it. It's in the cultural DNA. Witness this account, as posted by the Buffalo Field Campaign, an activist organization that defends the Yellowstone herd. Quote, on March 7, 1997, during a winter when 1,084 buffalo were killed, American Indian tribal leaders from around the country gathered near Gardner, Montana, to hold a day of prayer for the buffalo. The ceremony was disrupted by the echo of gunshots. Lakota elder Rosalie Little Thunder left the prayer circle to investigate the shots. Less than two miles away, Department of Livestock agents had killed 14 buffalo. Walking across the field to pray over the bodies, she was arrested and charged with criminal trespass. To Little Thunder and other tribal members present, there was no question of coincidence. They shot the buffalo because we were at that place on that day at that time, she said. End quote. As the buffalo herds were being decimated in the 19th century, the entire floristic web of the tall grass prairie was being plowed under. Unfortunately for the prairie community, the soils it produces are ideal for agriculture. Explains John's Garden, quote, The soils of the tall grass prairie are among the deepest and most productive for grain crops of any on earth. They represent the breakdown of products of thousands of generations of annual productivity of grass and other herbaceous organic matter. Because of these organic materials and the clays usually present in prairie soils, such soils have excellent water holding capabilities. In addition to the humus and related organic matter thus produced, many prairie legumes have nitrogen-fixing root bacteria that enrich and fertilize the soil to a depth of at least 15 feet. Earthworms and various vertebrate animals, such as gophers, make subterranean burrows that mix and aerate prairie soils, in the case of earthworms, to a depth of 13 feet or more. End quote. So for all the species of plants and animals of the tall grass prairie, who number in the thousands if you count the insects, the end was nigh, as soon as the Europeans arrived en masse, which didn't happen until after 1850. Less than a century later, most of this unique ecology was gone. In the present day, the tall grass prairie ecosystem is even more rare than old-growth forest, with less than 4% of it remaining. Most of that is in the western part of its former range, in Kansas and Oklahoma. In the eastern parts, such as Illinois, less than 1% is left. Like the slaughter of the buffalo, a loss on this scale is unimaginable. Agriculture replaces the wild with the domestic, and in the tall grass prairie it did so rapidly with deranged ruthlessness. Voices for Nature and Peace is produced in the Gila River Valley, New Mexico, USA, on land that we acknowledge is illegally occupied Apache territory. The intro music is Zero G Yogi by Big Z, with narration by Kelly Moody of the Ground Shots podcast. This outro music is Trip A, also by Big Z. Commercial break narration by Nikki Hill. To become a financial supporter of this podcast, and to gain access to members-only content, visit patreon.com slash colibri. 
K O L L I B R I. For more information on Radio Free Sunroot programming, please visit RadioFreeSunroot.com. Thank you for listening. May you find joy in your own nature and peace.